Um, I'm Ann Hugh. Um, I'm chair of the House Human Services Committee. So that you know who you're talking to. Why don't we just say our name and what part of the country, I mean, what part of the state. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like a country. <laughs> I'm Mary Beth Redmond, and I live in Essex. Carl? I'm oh, sorry, Carl Rosenquist, represents the town of Georgia. And I'm Jessica Bremstead, and I represent part of Shelburne and St. George. I'm so Sandy. all over the state. <laughs> I'm Sandy Haas, I live in Rochester, and represent three more towns in that neighborhood. Oh, I'm sorry. You, were, you already said you Okay. I'm uh, <laughs> Teresa Wood, and I represent Waterbury, Bolton, Huntington, and Buell's Gore. Good morning, I'm Dan Noyce. I represent Wilkett, Hyde Park, Johnson, and Belvedere. <coughs> I'm James Gregoire, Fairview, Fletcher, and Bakersfield. I'm Kelly Tayala, Londonderry, Weston, Jamaica, Windhall, and Stratton. So, Jenna, you're talking to people from all over, <laughs> all around the state. And thank you very much for being here for um, Mental Health um, um, Advocacy Day. And I understand you have some things that you want to say to us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jenna would just like to share her story about where she is now, but I just wanted to give a little brief history about where she's been. And she also has traveled, huh? Yes. Right? Um, Jenna is 28 years old and has a two year old daughter. As a, as a child, you had many um, ear infections, so she has a hearing loss. She has some scoliosis. She's been diagnosed with PTSD, a neurodevelopmental disorder, um, and ADHD, right? Yeah. Uh, with her family, they traveled quite a bit. They moved about eight times in Jenna's, um, before she was a teenager. Um, she The family survived a fire in their home and lost everything. Her personal. Yeah, uh, Jenna left home probably when she was about 15, 16. Uh, traveled down to Louisiana where she met uh, a young man and they got into drugs together. Uh, she was with this young man for about four or five years, right? And then came back home to live in Vermont with her mother. Her mom and dad divorced after 27 years of marriage. He was a verbally abusive uh, father, uh, not toward Jenna or the children, but toward, toward your mom. Towards my mother, because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. she had an affair on him, and it was his only friend, so. And mm -hmm. I didn't know um, he didn't drink for many years. Mm -hmm. uh, he quit when I was a baby. I was born it was way back then, you know, but you're having a boy or a girl, so. I'm the youngest out of three, the only girl. Um, so when you came back to Vermont, you connected up with the father of your baby, Robert, who uh, also is a drug abuser. And together they sort of couch surfed and uh, landed up um, delivering, delivering her young daughter, Teresa, who absolutely is the cutest little thing you've ever seen. <laughs> um, and. Uh, Teresa had to be weaned with methadone when she was born. Uh, on one occasion, um, when they were shooting up, uh, Rob uh, shot uh, Jenna, and you lost uh, a thumb, part of the I thumb. lost two of my fingers. Um, yes, I would like to speak out to young teens one day about drug abuse and it's the scariest thing. I never thought that would happen to me. Um, I deal with it a lot better than I thought. I tried hiding it for the longest time. Um, that was after I lost my daughter. I got into um, Washington County Run Help. I volunteered to do it to get my daughter back because Rob cared more about drinking with his friends and drugging and I lost my fingers so he stopped going to visits and then I moved in with my mom and then I started getting overnights and worked my way back up so hopefully uh, next month I'll have full custody. Um, <laughs> 
Yes. She looks, congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. 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 Uh, She's worked very hard, very hard. So you I was in, in one, a home. One developmental home. That just looked at me like I was a paycheck. Uh, didn't treat me like, really like I was a person. Didn't do much for me. Um, and I do have a license, but I have no car. Um, I am not on Social Security, so um, I mean, it's tough to live nowadays. Um, but I am very grateful to have a home and a very warm, loving environment. Um, I could not be more happier than to be put where we were. At first, I didn't want to go. Um, I thought I wanted to stay where I was. And um, even though it was not a match, yes, it, it just didn't meet Jenna's needs. Mm -hmm. And so we worked very hard to find another placement. And I remember the day that we went to look at it with Maria, who was here. Yes. And, and what did you say? I said that there was, she had a great aura, and I felt a good connection uh, because she was, um, I like doing art, I like uh, cleaning and doing material. I want to do an interior decorating one day. Um, so like she just made like a whole gym for her own art. Um, well, I'll say, where I used to live, she used to always tell me, oh, you, your place is cluttered, you have too much stuff, and there's too much stuff on the walls, and just, you know, it was so, it was like, oh, there's somebody who likes to decorate like that. Who <laughs> <laughs> I like to decorate. So, um. So what's the best thing about being at Maria's? You have who with you? <clears throat> My daughter. Oh, oh. fabulous. Yes, and it's our home, and we are family. Like, mm -hmm. uh, so it's important for you to continue with getting the services that have gotten her where she is today. Yes, because um, so in the beginning of all this um, support, I didn't know what it meant, and it's very important to me. Uh, because along the way I lost a lot of my supports because I've accomplished so much. Um, but it's, DCF had asked me if I was done with um, them, that I was going to continue working for Washington and Health. And I said, yes, I would really like to, it's because I'm not ready for you know, no supports, um, and it's nice to be able to, if I need to get a hold of somebody, to say, you know, that is, get a hold of Marie, so uh, somebody that will pick up their phone, and lots of people pick their phone up half the time. So, it's accomplished my sobriety as well. Because mm -hmm. um, it's so good to have my mind off, you know, um, being around those kinds of people um, that I used to hang out with. Um, my best friend since the kindergarten um, did talk to me for like a couple of years because of my um, addictions, and now she's back and I'm able to call and talk with her, so it's nice. Good friends. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Jenna is in treatment. She has a full compendium of, of treatment providers. Yeah. Uh, she's working with the MAP team, which is the medically assisted mm -hmm. team. Mm -hmm. And so she uses Suboxone, regular checks. She has a nurse that that's just her nurse. Um, she has a psychiatrist, therapist. Yes, and my she's psychiatrist, and ever since I was 50. Yep, mm -hmm. Dr. Rose. So, you've had an incredible history. 
Yeah. Um, to have you come here today and talk to us and share your story is really incredible and that you're living with your daughter <coughs> and that you are not taking drugs is fabulous. It takes a lot of hard work mm -hmm. and I think I can speak for everyone on this committee that we will remember your story when we um, and how services were important and are important to you that when we make our recommendations for the budget that we will keep you in mind. Okay. It took a lot for me to come here. She wasn't going to come. I had a hard, <laughs> I had a hard time. Um, I get a lot better of overcoming my, um, how do I put it? Anxiety? Anxiety, yes. Of being around lots of people, mm -hmm. lots and of crowds. And look at you. And You're not only yeah. yeah. the you yeah. but you've got a room full of people yeah. here. Yeah. So, Jenna, thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much. much. Just knowing from who's sitting around the room, um, individuals hold very different perspectives and views on this legislation. And um, some of you may disagree with what is being said. Um, I appreciate your disagreement, but you need to keep that to yourself, um, and not on the sidelines. Um, thank you very much. And why don't we start with, um, oh, I hope I pronounced this right, um, Dr. Nasca? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you have, I believe, um, Representative Rosenberg to, um, right. to thank her yes. for, for being here. Thank you. Thanks for allowing me to be here. Uh, sure. Ms. Pugh and Carl, and another rep from uh, mm her -hmm. county. Um, my name is Joe Nasca. I'm a pediatrician. I work in Franklin County, Vermont, and Georgia. Um, I've been practicing in pediatrics uh, since 1991 in Vermont. Um, I'm on the clinical teaching faculty of the Department of Pediatrics. So I have medical students that rotate through the office. I'm board certified by the Academy of Pediatrics. Um, I've been president of the medical staff at Northwest Medical Center. I've chaired the Department of Pediatrics at Northwest Medical Center. I have active privileges at Northwest at UVM, and um, I'm a counselor for Franklin County, that would be at Vermont Medical Society. So I've been doing peds for a long time, um, and I asked uh, Senator Rosenquist if I could, or excuse me, Representative Rosenquist, if I could justify your committee. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I apologize. You get a promotion card. Or a promotion As you said, there are very many uh, diverse opinions on this bill, and I would ask that the, um, as the bill moves through its process, that you respect that diversity of opinion. Um, many of us that work in healthcare come to our life's work through some strong ethical, moral, religious convictions, and work in healthcare is hard. You know, we're on call 24-7. Um, we're there for everybody. We're there for each other. Um, recently, my best friend had a uh, heart attack on Sunday morning, and he was quickly taken to the medical center where he was taken care of, and um, he was uh, surprised by how well it all worked uh, on and off schedule. And I think we try hard in healthcare to make it work. Um, you know, for a lot of us, abortion, um, and as this bill moves through, I, and I, I think the issue of infanticide needs to come up, um, this is really a difficult position for, for many of us. Um, I would ask that as the bill moves forward, you provide some sort of a clause for um, conscience protection, that people in healthcare who work and feel very differently have some cover at, for their own conscience and um, will providing or not providing care be uh, considered obstructive. I know the bill has language about obstruction, and as my concern, one of my concerns is that UVMMC gets bigger and begins to take care of more and more of the health care in Vermont, it becomes one care. Will it be one provider? And if they have policies that say, you know, this is our policy, will somebody who uh, feels differently about that have an opportunity to say, my conscience doesn't uh, allow me to participate in this? So I ask you please to respect the diversity, um, if, if I could. Um, after Carl and I spoke, uh, I opened my mail, and as it would happen, um, this uh, uh, article from the Mayo Clinic came up, and I thought I'd share at least the cover with you. Um, it's about uh, infant surgery. Um, so uh, 
things have progressed in healthcare to the point that um, surgeons are now able to um, provide surgery for the infant inside the mother. Uh, so this is where we're at um, in the world of medicine. Um, I think what maybe concerns many of us uh, is that the bill states that um, uh, line 18C, a fertilized egg embryo or fetus shall not have independent rights under Vermont law. Um, many of us who work in healthcare spend a lot of time arguing with insurance companies about prior authorization and um, getting things done for our patients. I can't imagine the discussion that we would be having about mm -hmm. infant surgery. Um, and I think if I was the bean counter in the insurance company, I would say, well, I don't know, you live in Vermont. The infant has no rights in Vermont. We're not going to cover that. So I think there's a lot of questions that get raised by this. Um, I have personally cared for an infant during my residency who was, quote, unquote, a missed abortion. Um, she was aborted downstairs. Uh, a nurse saw that she was breathing, brought her upstairs, and we cared for the intensive care, and she survived. Um, viability, we had grand rounds last year. Uh, we've always considered viability at 24 weeks gestation. There's evidence now for 22 and 23 weeks gestation. So I think you need to consider that issue of viability. I don't think we want to move from abortion to infanticide. Um, and I would just ask you to please respect um, other people's conscience as you move forward. Are there any questions? Carl. With the uh, child that was born uh, part of a, an abortion, uh, what was the outcome of that? I mean, well, how, how far along was that? Um, she was, uh, would have been a late trimester, second trimester abortion, and she survived uh, through her care in the intensive care unit, I don't know, I mm -hmm. left training. So. Mm -hmm. I, I, as I was thinking about testimony, I have a 19-year-old boy who's about to graduate from high school this year. He was born at just over 26 weeks gestation. He weighed um, just over a pound. And he was born at UVM, and I've cared for him for the 19 years. And he's wonderful, you know, full speed ahead, senior in high school. Um, couldn't pick him out. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Gibson. Can you pass this along? Yes. <laughs> I'm, oh, I apologize, Dr. Gibson. Um, did you have written remarks? If you have written remarks, if you do not, that's fine. But if you do, please give them to me. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Excuse me, I have a little bit of a sore throat, so I may take some sips of water while I speak. As long as it's bottled water, you can't drink the water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? It's good to I, know. I There's boiled water in my oh. in water. Okay, thank you. So, good morning, Chairperson Pugh, Vice Chair Haas, Ranking Member McVaughn, and members of the House Committee on Human Services. I am grateful to all of you for the opportunity to be here today to show my support for Bill H-57, an act relating to preserving the right to abortion, which would codify abortion rights in Vermont law. My name is Dr. Erica Gibson, and I'm a pediatrician specializing in adolescent medicine at the University of Vermont Children's Hospital. In my day-to-day -day work, I am the director of adolescent medicine at UVM Children's Hospital, where I see patients in the adolescent medicine specialty clinic majority of those patients are those suffering with severe eating disorders. I'm also a Suboxone prescriber. I'm also the medical director of our transgender youth program. I work at Woodside Juvenile Rehabilitation Facility and on the pediatric hospital ward. I also have grant funding to work on a variety of adolescent health issues, including teen pregnancy prevention, prescription opioid abuse prevention, and adolescent well care here in Vermont. Previously to coming to Vermont, I worked at Columbia University Medical Center and New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City, where I had appointments in both the Department of Pediatrics and the Department of Population and Family Health at the Mailman School of Public Health. Today, I am speaking to you as a physician, as a member of the Executive Board of the Vermont Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and as a member of the Vermont Medical Society. I am not here to express views of the University of Vermont Medical Center. As you already may know, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Vermont Medical Center both strongly support minors' rights to confidential sexual and reproductive health services, including abortion. Many other professional or medical organizations also support access to confidential abortion care for minors. 
These include the American Medical Association, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine, the American Public Health Association, and many others. I have spent the majority of my medical career focusing on adolescent sexual and reproductive health care, including prevention of unintended teen pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections. Access to safe, confidential abortion services has also been part of that work. I believe that abortion is part of the full spectrum of reproductive health care, and it should be treated as the normal and common experience that it is. I come before you today to describe how minors' rights to confidential sexual and reproductive health care, including abortion, are essential to the health and well-being of the young people that we care for. I feel that age 57 should codify current practice with regard to abortion care in this state, and no changes should be made to the status quo. Confidentiality in adolescent and young adult health care is clinically essential developmentally expected, and is an important element in protecting the health of individual young people and our public health. Decades of research have found that privacy protection encourages young people to seek essential health care and speak openly with their health care providers. Likewise, other research shows that if patients are not assured confidentiality, they actually avoid seeking health care or involving trusted adults in their decision making. Many state and federal laws, as well as ethical guidelines, require confidential protection and support the rights of adolescents and young adults to receive confidential health care in certain situations, particularly related to sexual and reproductive health, mental health, and substance use. It should be noted that when agreeing to confidential health services, a clinician needs to take into account whether a young person has the cognitive and emotional ability to understand the nature and risks of a proposed treatment and is capable of making an informed decision and a rational choice. It is ironic to note that in some states, pregnant and parenting teens are allowed to fully consent to their own care and the care of their fetus or child while they are not allowed to make the confidential choice to choose an abortion if they so desire at the same age. While I routinely offer confidential health care to my patients, as appropriate, the majority of young people that I care for do involve a trusted parent, guardian, or an adult, another adult in sexual and reproductive health care decisions. As you heard in previous testimony, we also know that most minors faced with an unplanned pregnancy will voluntarily disclose to a parent or a trusted adult. As clinicians caring for these young people, this is one of the first questions we ask them when they are faced with a challenging decision. What adults can you rely on for support in your decision making? How can we help you to communicate with them? What can we do to help? In terms of unplanned pregnancy, we know that every pregnancy is unique and every individual's decision about their pregnancy is deeply personal. We also know that some, some young people do not live in supportive and functional home circumstances. They may choose not to involve parents in abortion decisions due to adverse home situations, including family trauma, instability, household substance abuse, or physical or sexual abuse, many of the issues that we now recognize as adverse child experiences or ACEs. Young people may also choose to keep a decision about abortion confidential due to fear, fear for their own safety, fear of disappointing parents or damaging relationships with them. They may fear judgment, shame, or rejection. They may fear being forced to continue a pregnancy. In addition, some may not even feel close to or even live with their designated parent or guardian. While federal law guarantees a minor's right to an abortion, in some states, parental involvement laws require that a minor either notify a parent or guardian or obtain parental consent prior to obtaining an abortion. Forty years ago, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that there must be a waiver process available to minors who do not or cannot involve a parent in their abortion decision, a process known as judicial bypass. Some of the research on the adolescent experience with judicial bypass reveals the following. Adolescents experience the bypass process as a form of punishment for their sexuality, pregnancy, and abortion decision. The process includes logistical burdens, unpredictability, and humiliation, resulting in traumatic experiences for some. This combined sense of punishment, humiliation, and internalization of abortion stigma can be associated with isolation, emotional suppression, long-term psychological distress, and hesitancy 
to seek health care. Such a negative experience is highly consequential for adolescents going through a critical development period, particularly for adolescents that have little support from their parents. It is particularly hard to understand why we would force a young person to go through a judicial bypass bypass experience in light of the scientific evidence that there is no association between abortion and risk of depression, suicide, or other emotional harms. In summary, the majority of young women are capable of understanding the consequences of abortion and do not need state-mandated parental involvement, involvement or judicial bypass to make the decisions that are right for them. Those of us that are experts in the field of adolescent medicine feel that most young women are mature enough to decide whether to carry a pregnancy or seek an abortion. And we know that most seek out advice on their own from parents or trusted adults. In addition, we feel that mandated parental notification, consent, or judicial bypass can actually be more harmful to adolescent health than seeking an abortion. I want to thank the Vermont's House leadership, especially House Human Service Committee Chair Representative <coughs> Pugh for being the lead sponsor of this bill. On behalf of my patients, AAP Vermont and the Vermont Medical Society, I respect, respectfully ask the Vermont House of Representatives to pass H57 to ensure that abortion rights and minors' rights to confidential abortion services are protected in Vermont. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. Are there questions? Come on. I guess I'd, I'd be curious what why we do not want to protect a woman's right up to the point of viability, but beyond that, some consideration taken to that an abortion wouldn't just be an option for a woman unless there was some specific medical reason for it. Well, I think it's just very complicated, and situations vary per the individual, and it's for that individual and their care providers and all the supports they have to help make those decisions themselves without anyone else interfering. If I, if I could just follow up, I mean, mm -hmm. it seems to me we're, with this bill, we're taking it beyond the protections that, that women currently have uh, provided by Roe versus Wade and are essentially codifying uh, the right to abortion up to the point of delivery. This is my understanding. It's not codified that way now. It's just not addressed. So. That's my understanding. That's not my understanding of the bill. That's what it says. That it goes beyond that. I'm sorry? If that's not my understanding of the bill, that it goes beyond that point. And I was asked just to testify about the minor's rights to be able to make a decision. So I can't comment on that, but maybe okay. some of the and previous folks um, that have And Carl, that. we can yeah. um, we'll testify. Yeah. Okay. And, um, we'll provide information for us at the end and one of the things she can no, I, I was for wondering you. what her opinion was. <coughs> See, if you basically address it, just the parental notification issue. Can you speak on the, con the rights of confidential services? Yes. Thank you. Um, so on parental rights or, or whatever, um, so in just about every aspect of life, a minor doesn't have the rights to do anything without an adult supervision. So something as important in this as this why wouldn't um, writers um, support them having to notify? And I realize I'm going to say this: notify parent. But um, there are cases, as you said, the parents are part of the problem, uh, or there's other issues. But we do have a legal system. We have uh, guardian, guardians, guardians can point and anything else that um, a child on their own at 12, 13 years old. Um, they really don't have the capacity to make these decisions of something that they don't their own. So that's a lot of questions in one. Uh, let me address them. So, you know, it's, it's rare to have pregnancies in that age group for one. Um, secondly, a child is never on their own in these situations. They're in the care of an educated and skilled team that often reaches beyond just an individual, pro individual provider. And again, the majority of young people do engage with um, their parents in making these decisions. And it is very important as clinicians for us to assess whether someone has, again, as I stated in my testimony, the cognitive and clinical capacity to make these decisions. If we were ever worried that they did not, um, then we would um, have larger discussions with other people on our care teams within our organizations. And, um, potentially involve family if necessary. And 
feeling that it's James. So I always judge things and say, well, I would do it this way, right? So you said, like, if there was questions about the cognitive ability, you personally, I bet, would say, well, we have questions. We've got to put the brakes on this. But can you understand the, the concern among other people that there are people in every field who don't live up to the standard that we think they should live up to? You know, um, so they may not. They'd be like, no, the, the child wants this, and we're going to do it because that's that's what. And you may not have an agenda, but somebody else somewhere has an agenda, and they're like, no, we're going to do this. And and, uh, and I'm I'm the adult in the room, so to speak. Um, so the the fear of the people that say, well, maybe we need somebody on the outside of that um, process to say, let's let's slow down, like supervision. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I understand it, your it, point, and I it, agree that's yeah. a, a possibility in my experience. Okay. It's a rare possibility. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Send it to you ahead of time, but it didn't get finished very early last night. So. <laughs> I was going to say this morning, um, if you wouldn't mind leaving it with um, Julie, we'd yes. appreciate that mm -hmm. so that um, people who aren't here would be able to. Uh, good morning. My name is Sharon Toward. I am here to testify on behalf of the Vermont Right to Life Committee on age 57. The Vermont Right to Life Committee was founded in 1971. And our mission is to achieve universal recognition of the sanctity of human life from conception through natural death. In pursuit of that mission, the RLC, through peaceful legal means, seeks changes in public opinion, public policy, the law, and individual behavior that respect the right to life and reject abortion, euthanasia, and other actions that deny the right to life. I'd like to begin this morning by offering uh, some additional information relating to points that have been made by others who have testified here before your committee already. With regard to the born alive rule, which has received much discussion, the Vermont District Court ruled in 1988 that Edward Ramkey could not be charged with manslaughter even though he kicked his pregnant wife in the abdomen fracturing the skull, injuring the brain, and causing the death of his unborn daughter. In another case, the Vermont Supreme Court similarly ruled that a fetus is not a person under Vermont statute. However, both courts indicated that the legislature is free to amend from Vermont law to extend the definition of person to include a viable fetus. Numerous states have enacted some sort of fetal homicide legislation. Vermont has not, but that does not mean that they can not. Are babies sometimes born alive instead of dying as a result of abortion? Yes. We heard about one case here already this morning, and there's actually a website called abortionsurvivors.com that talks about the stories of many uh, people who are alive today, grown adults, living lives like you and I, who were uh, born as a result of an attempted abortion. And Dr. Lauren McAfee, in her uh, presentation entitled Updates on Family Planning Services at UVMMC, given on February 15, 2018, stated that the UVM Medical Center would offer elective abortions through 22 weeks, six days of pregnancy and abortions later in pregnancy with the involvement of the Ethics Committee. This was to be in line with their colleagues in the neonatal intensive care unit who offer full resuscitation for neonates born at 23 weeks and beyond. McAfee noted that before 23 weeks, outcomes are variable, so resuscitation is offered in some, but not all cases. I doubt a child born alive as a result of an abortion would be among those who would receive such care. And while Dr. McAfee in her testimony last week indicated that she always makes sure to kill the fetus in utero 
by injecting it with a drug to stop the heartbeat or by clamping the cord which causes the baby to suffocate. This committee needs to be aware that one, that does not always work and also that not all abortionists follow her procedures. And of course, if this legislation were to become law, an abortionist could not be required to follow those procedures. And I would refer you also to uh, a website, abortionprocedures.com, where Dr. Anthony Levitino, an OBGYN who's performed over 1,200 abortions, describes various abortion procedures that take place throughout pregnancy. And while testimony from your January 23rd hearings does not appear to have been recorded, so I didn't have the opportunity to listen to it, I have... Excuse me. Um, I, um, we will get back to you in terms of oh, okay. um, everything is always recorded, and if it is not put, recorded, put in a request, and it was didn't seem to be available at least at the time the request was made. Uh, I was told by someone who was in attendance that there seemed to be some doubt about the reality of partial birth abortion. Here I agree with Dr. Matafee, who noted both in her 2018 presentation and here in this committee last week, that partial birth abortions are prohibited by federal law. They are defined in Title 18 of the U.S. Code, and it is an abortion where a fetus is intentionally delivered deliberately and alive partially before the abortionist takes an overt action to cause the death of the, of the child before finishing delivery. Uh, Congress voted to prohibit partial birth abortion in 2003. The legislation was supported by pro-life and pro-choice lawmakers. And even Vermont Senator Patrick Leahy, a pro-choice senator, voted in favor of the ban on partial birth abortions. Planned Parenthood challenged the law, but it was upheld by the Supreme Court in 2007. In her testimony last week, Megan Gallagher, CEO of Planned Parenthood of Northern New England, encouraged passage of age 57, claiming it re represents the people of Vermont's position on abortion. It does not. While most Vermonters do consider themselves pro-choice, that does not mean that they support unrestricted abortion throughout all nine months of pregnancy for individuals of any age, as age 57 proposes. In a poll commissioned by Vermont Right to Life in 2000, 59% of Vermonters called themselves pro-choice, but only 11% said abortion should be illegal in the, all the time. 72% of Vermonters in that poll said excluding abortion, it should be a crime in Vermont for someone to hurt or kill an unborn child in the womb, either intentionally or through negligence. 72% also re supported requiring a physician or clinic to notify a parent before performing an abortion on a daughter who is under 18 years of age. While this polling data is from some years ago, a May 2018 Gallup poll also demonstrates that being pro-choice does not equal support for the full agenda of the abortion lobby. It found that 48% of Americans consider themselves pro-choice, but only 13% said abortion should be generally legal in the last three months of pregnancy. And in 2011, the most recent year that Gallup asked the question, 71% of respondents supported a law requiring women under 18 to get parental consent, not just notification, for any abortion even though 47% of respondents consider themselves pro-choice. Age 57 would prohibit abortion regulation and fetal homicide laws favored by Vermonters. <laughs> Many legislators have questioned why this bill is being proposed now when it does not change the legality of abortion in any way. And I think we need to look beyond the first section of the bill, which has gotten most of the attention here in this committee. There are provisions that could potentially represent significant changes. However, such terms as, quote, interfere with, quote, deprive, quote, restrict, are undefined in the bill. So it is unclear what the true impact of this legislation might be. For instance, many states have passed provisions requiring women to be given information about fetal development and alternatives uh, prior to having an abortion. I would consider this an effort to make sure women 
are making an informed decision. However, the abortion advocates, like Planned Parenthood, challenge these provisions in court, calling them a restriction on abortion. And since we don't have definitions in this statute, there's no way to tell where the law comes down on those things. So the question is, would the bill uh, make providing such information a, uh, an actionable, actionable event? Would school counselors be prevented from informing a student about alternatives to abortion? Would our public schools and municipal libraries be forced to remove books that present a pro-life perspective or describe fetal development? Would our schools have to abandon policies that ensure both sides of controversial issues are discussed in our classrooms? If that is the intent or the result of age 57, our legal counsel has advised us it would be actionable. With public entities playing an ever increasingly larger role in our healthcare system, I wonder, would age 57 result in even more taxpayer funding of abortion? Would abortion have to be given funding priority over other procedures? If an abortionist wants to set up a new facility in Vermont, would it be exempt from the certificate of need process and other regulatory burdens placed on other medical facilities? And the abortion lobby calls nearly every regulation intended to protect the health and safety of women having abortions interference with the right to choose. For those of you who aren't aware, your counterparts in the Senate have introduced S-25, which would eliminate all civil, criminal, and administrative liability for any person performing a legal abortion in Vermont. And we anticipate the, a move to add that language to H-57 if the bill gets to the Senate. Under that scenario, how would Vermont be able to protect women from abortion providers like Kermit Gosnell, who is currently in prison for killing two of his patients and murdering infants born alive? What tools would the state have to put someone like him out of business? They would have none. Proponents of this bill have stated that it is important for the legislature to make it clear where they stand on abortion. And I agree. When the roll is called on H-57, each and every legislator will have to go on the record as being for or against unrestricted abortion throughout pregnancy, for or against a parent's right to know, for or against placing abortion in a privileged place in our public policy. Will they declare their vote by their votes that Vermont is indifferent to the health and safety of women seeking abortions, indifferent as to whether an unborn baby that is viable, is born, or aborted, whether it lives or dies? And I hope not. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, before you stand, um, are there questions for Sharon? Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, please, um, you can also make a copy if you want to take that with you so that we can. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, Yes, could you call and maybe make a copy for... Her? Yes. Okay, we have to unplug. Um, the next um, person is Peter... Gummery. Uh, Peter Gummery, and he is on the phone. And he has testimony online. And he has testimony online for our, <laughs> for our, our, our experts. Can you... Yeah. Okay. Thank you. There is something in there. There is something online too. Okay. When I get it. Okay. We're going to be reading up there, so you will. I'm going to put you on speakerphone with the previous. Just one moment. Hello. Um, uh, good morning. Um, this is Representative Ann Pugh. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I assume you can hear me. Uh, we can. We hear you loud and clear. Um, just to uh, make sure that you are aware, a you are on tape and we. Um, 
Your testimony is up on uh, our whiteboard, so people who are um, listening to the testimony also can see it. And yep. um, thank you very much. And please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, rather than uh, simply reading the testimony that I prepared, I'd just like to focus, if I could, on uh, specific highlights. You know, I think that there are times that uh, we conceive of a solution or develop a solution that uh, has unintended consequences. And uh, for example, you know, I think the, the first point that I make is uh, protecting legal uh, right to uh, terminate pregnancy. Uh, you know, there's kind of an acknowledgement that women also have a right to deliver that pregnancy, but uh, that, that isn't uh, supported by uh, strong language the way that the right to terminate is. The other thing which is really uh, a major concern, uh, in my career as a manager, uh, twice while working here in Vermont, uh, a woman uh, requested help with the fact that she was being threatened by her boyfriend who wanted her to terminate the pregnancy. Uh, these were two separate incidents uh, uh, over several different uh, uh, several years apart. Um, and both cases, uh, the boyfriend had explained that he did not want to pay additional child support. And in one case, uh, as I noted in my testimony, uh, he actually started to uh, punch her in the abdomen. He was there on site and uh, uh, was actually doing that, and we intervened appropriately. The second uh, was a very clear threat of uh, uh, not, uh, that, that he would make sure that she did not uh, deliver the pregnancy live. And um, so, you know, we immediately got law enforcement involved. Um, the, uh, the third incident, uh, I have a daughter-in-law who uh, had a, a child uh, uh, prior to meeting my son, and um, she told me that uh, she had uh, been beaten on and literally thrown to the floor, hitting her head on the floor, uh, and you know, she still has the uh, mark or evidence of the, uh, uh, there's a lump on her head uh, from that uh, event. Uh, it, it, it's really clear to me that these women also need protection. Uh, and, you know, if we're going to do this to protect the right to abortion, uh, should we be doing something to uh, protect women from boyfriends that don't want to pay child support? Um, the third point, and this gets into the bioethics area, uh, and that is conscience protection. I think uh, providers and healthcare personnel need to be protected from being compelled to uh, uh, do uh, something that's contrary to their either their good judgment or their uh, ethical stance. Uh, the question of public entities, I, I talked about the uh, public school counselors, uh, whether they uh, would be prohibited from uh, mentioning a, uh, a pro-life option, uh, as well as talking uh, about uh, uh, abortion option, uh, would there be any prohibition against that, and would there be any uh, requirement, or could there be a requirement that uh, both sides of the question are presented objectively? And then uh, the final one is really a, a matter of significant concern because, you know, I don't think uh, the uh, H57 is going to do anything more than uh, uh, protecting Beecham versus Leahy. Uh, if, that is, if that is the objective, uh, you know, I'm not sure that we need to do H57. Uh, the question of fetal research uh, I talk about also uh, sale of fetal body parts. Uh, finally, uh, there are 
unintended consequences in the area of, uh, I, I, I believe that there may be unintended consequences in the area of tort uh, uh, actions. Uh, and I can think of uh, uh, two horrific uh, uh, situations. Uh, one was the thalidomide with uh, uh, use in uh, and then the uh, abnormalities and anomalies uh, resulting from thalidomide use, uh, but also uh, diethylstilbestrol, which was a very common uh, drug uh, used in the United States uh, during uh, uh, pregnancy for, I think it was upwards of 20 years, uh, presumably to uh, 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 help women who had had a uh, prior uh, miscarriage uh, from uh, miscarrying again. Of course, the uh, scientific evidence came out that uh, that was not uh, even effective in, uh, in uh, uh, achieving that goal, but also, as we learned in the 70s, 80s, uh, there were quite a few uh, uh, anomalies and uh, actually uh, uh, some serious ones caused by that in utero exposure. Uh, do we uh, believe that uh, there will be no new uh, thalidomides or uh, uh, DES uh, uh, type medications that uh, don't uh, get adequate uh, uh, screening? I, I think that we're probably much better than we used to be, but uh, that's still a possibility. There are also medical devices. And environmental uh, impact also. Uh, you know, we're, we're constantly coming up with uh, this plastic or that plasticizer. Uh, residues uh, have effects on uh, uh, the developing uh, uh, child. Uh, and I, I think that we may be uh, harming people by denying human status to the uh, uh, fetus. So those are the uh, things that I see as being compelling issues. And uh, I think the most compelling, of course, is the uh, issue of uh, protecting women from uh, um, violence uh, as somebody tries to uh, uh, get them to have an abortion. I have dealt with that uh, uh, several times personally uh, and had to intervene, so that is something that I am uh, deeply concerned about. And uh, the potential of uh, uh, injury to uh, uh, a developing fetus is uh, uh, also a real one. So. Those are my concerns, and I hope that you will uh, make uh, changes to uh, address them. Any questions? Okay. Do you have any questions for um, Mr. Gomez? Gomez? Apologize. Oh. Wonder what he was the manager of. He was referring to it. He seems to have had. Um, yeah, I, I worked in a hospital here, here in St. Johnsbury. I actually spent most of my career uh, working in the healthcare field, uh, and my uh, involvement in healthcare has ranged from a uh, on the bench research scientist to a uh, uh, manager to a, couple, a legal compliance officer for a while, uh, and. Uh, uh, did a number of things that ultimately uh, developed an interest in uh, bioethics and uh, focused on that. Uh, served on an ethics committee for uh, 10 years or so. Uh, at what age uh, would you suggest uh, that uh, an infant be considered or, or a fetus be considered uh, what do you call it, uh, a person? Uh, you know, philosophically, I've got to look at what uh, the uh, stages of development are, and you know, also putting on my scientific brain. Uh, 
uh, from conception to birth, the uh, organism is, it's the same organism. It is not uh, at the same stage of development, but I, I think that we would need to recognize uh, the zygote as a person. Thank you. And that's, that's strictly scientific side of my brain and the philosophical, ethical uh, issues being uh, uh, merged. Thank you. Yes. Uh, are there any other questions for Mr. Gummery? Thank you very much for testifying. You were very clear, and thank you for um, uh, providing testimony in writing so we can yeah. review that again. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Sharon, I apologize. You're going to have to. I know. <laughs> it was nice while it was. <laughs> um, Samantha Sheehan. Hi. Hi. I also have a cold today, so I'll try to speak loudly, but I apologize. I might also do this before I hand you hot papers. <laughs> um, so I did uh, submit testimony yesterday. And um, I have copies. Let me pass it up. Okay. Um, for the record, my name is Samantha Sheehan. I'm the communications manager for Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility, and I'm here today to offer testimony on behalf of that organization and our membership. Uh, if it's not part of your testimony, this is the first time you or someone from EBSR is. Testify, and we have members who are new to the legislature. Sure. Um, so, VBSR is a um, statewide business association um, with about 700 business members um, who support a business ethic in Vermont, which supports um, the people of Vermont, the environments of Vermont, um, and the prosperity of the businesses uh, which participate in our organization. Uh, we are the largest statewide business association focused on social responsibility, um, and we're in our 29th year um, of operation. Um, EBSR supports universal access to affordable health care uh, the, in the communities in which the individuals live and work, and that should include the fundamental right to freedom of reproductive choice without public entities interfering or restricting the right of an individual to refuse contraception or sterilization, or to choose to carry a pregnancy to term, to give birth to a child, or to obtain an abortion. Um, VBSR urges the legislature to advance legislation that will support women's ability to participate in the Vermont labor force to their highest potential. 51% of Vermonters are women and girls, making up 45% of the full-time workforce and 73% of the part-time workforce. 33% of adult women in Vermont hold a bachelor's degree or higher, um, which is six points higher than the United States average for adult women and four points higher than um, that of Vermont men. VBSR recognizes that Vermont women have tremendous potential to contribute to our professional community here. Uh, there's a wealth of data relating an individual's access to reproductive health care to their ability to invest in their own education and workforce training, as well as their ability to participate in the full-time year-round labor force. In my written testimony, I've provided some of that data for you today. Of the number of uh, positive outcomes reported by women who have seeked reproductive uh, health care services from family planning clinics, 51% reported the ability to complete their education and 50% reported the ability to get or keep a job. Conversely, women who experienced a refusal of abortion services were more likely to be living in poverty six months later and were more likely to be unemployed, living in poverty or below the federal poverty line, and receiving public assistance up to four years after the refusal of abortion. Uh, simply put, uh, what I'd like to communicate today is that when a woman is able to make her own decisions about reproductive health care, including when and whether to have children, she is empowered in her own financial well-being 
and is able to better invest in the prosperity of her family and her whole community. Um, today, family planning is the most effective way that an individual can close their lifetime wage gap. Uh, highly educated women receive the greatest economic benefit from delaying, in, delaying childbearing. And by um, delaying a first child until an individual's late 20s or 30s, a woman can mitigate the family gap and contribute to her family's strength and economic stability. The family gap meaning the immediate drop in earnings that a woman experiences after having their first child and which continues to impact their lifetime earnings and ability to contribute to the financial well-being and stability of that family. That's all. Thank you, Samantha. Um, are there questions? Um, in, yes, okay, we've lots. Um, Sandy and then Carl. Um, I, I was following along and I noticed that you <coughs> quoted some statistics that I didn't see in your written materials. So if there's a supplement to what you sent us, that would be nice. They were included in the written materials. I just chose an excerpt of, that, of them. Okay. Um, so the data I quoted that um, 51% of women report the ability to finish their education. Um, that's included in the second data set from the report of reasons for using contraception perspectives of US women seeking specialized family planning clinics. And then the data relating to um, oh, the uh, family gap um, is in the following data set provided from the economic benefits of women's ability to determine whether and when to have children. I can provide them. Yeah. I think that's what people would find helpful. Thank you. Carl. It, it just seems that what you were saying is, uh, is that when a young woman is presented with the fact that she's pregnant and she thinks about her, uh, what to do, okay, that the organization seems to indicate the best decision would be to terminate the pregnancy because of financial reasons and, uh, going forward. No. That's, uh, you know, if, if she's not, let's say, supported by a, a partner who participated in the creation of the pregnancy. No. That's absolutely not the perspective okay. of this organization. Our perspective is that any individual should be able to make um, independent health care choices throughout, before, and during their experience of a pregnancy. I understand that, but it, it seems that then some of the data you're presenting is that it really isn't a very smart decision for that person to uh, to con continue with the pregnancy. I mean, that, that's what I sort of read between the lines or heard between the lines. Um, that's definitely not what I wanted to communicate. The data that I chose today to uh, include in my testimony, I hope um, communicates the very uh, real economic experiences of women who uh, work and who are investing in their education um, at the time at which they become pregnant, um, and the real economic circumstances that women are living in when they're considering when and whether they would like to have children. Um, it's the perspective of our organization that it should really only be that individual's choice um, whether to delay, um, to go forward with a pregnancy and, to, and resulting in live birth, or whether to seek an abortion at, at some point during the pregnancy. Thank you. Are there other questions for uh, Samantha? Samantha, thank you very much. Thank you. Hope you feel better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Okay, Dick, your, um, the next person is on the phone. Um, it is um, Patricia Blair from oh, Bennington. Right the That's right. <laughs> yeah. no and so, if you, um, Patricia? Yes? Um, 
Good morning. This is Representative Ann Pugh, and I chair the House Human Services Committee. Um, welcome. Um, I understand you have some uh, testimony that, that you would like to give us on H57. Um, I do want to let you know that um, along with the 11 members of the committee, there are many others in the room who will be listening to what you are saying. Um, after your comments, there may be questions from uh, members of the committee. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to start with thanking you giving me the opportunity to speak um, about this bill. I have a very personal reason to want to give testimony, and I think it'll explain itself as I continue. Um, in 2010, my husband and I were traveling home from pool shopping with our sons, and I was pregnant. Matter of fact, I was very pregnant with twins at the time in Bennington. Um, and I was. It talks about legislation legislature, judiciary, etc. It defines public entity, doesn't it? Somewhere here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, Page four. How does DCF have anything to say about anything? If we're saying in this bill, a public entity um, <clears throat> has no rights to anything, can't, can't restrict at all. Right. It, it, it prohibits a public entity from interfering with the right of a person to choose their own exactly. outcome. So in this case, isn't DCF? Uh, no, I don't believe, I mean, you can have DCF testify to this. I don't believe DCF is, um, is requiring any individuals in their care to have an abortion or not have an abortion. So I don't believe that this would change anything about what's happening. Okay, that, and it's even more important for me to understand what health care means in this bill because uh, uh, right now it's starting to mix the apples and oranges when, when that term gets used. In the, in the bill? Yeah. This is not the bill. I know that. I know it's not the bill. I, I've been reading that bill. So it's Look coming at this. Out of I'm impressed. <laughs> See all my notes? Read all my notes. No, I'm trying to find the, the places where. Public entity. Okay, there's public entity. Defines entity. it. <laughs> so, public entity. Yeah, I'm trying to find where the you're, word health you're is. You're doing a good job. Where, so, within right? healthcare provider, um, we define healthcare provider as a person who is authorized by law to provide professional. Healthcare services in the state of Vermont. Is that is that what you're thinking? Whether or not abortion falls within professional health care services? Is that here's probably that's probably where I'm going. Because I'm trying to define what they are now. Mm -hmm. So the health care provider is is the is health in and of itself is not a word in the bill. Health care provider is. Health care services. Oh, to provide health care services. Thank you. Is, is that where we're talking about within the definition of healthcare provider? I'm going to see if I can read it. Healthcare provider means a person, blah, 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 including a healthcare facility that is licensed, certified, and so on. And, it's, and is authorized by law. To provide professional health care services in the state, etc. And then it talks about public entity. Right DCF on. is a public entity. Mm -hmm. And um, what I'm wondering is how can the, the person is in the custody of DCF, how can DCF have anything to say about what health care services? that person gets. If this bill, if I could find out, somewhere in here it talks about the public, and here it is. It talks about agencies. Mm -hmm. So how can, how can they have anything 
to do with whether this person gets an abortion, doesn't get one, if it's, you can't restrict them. Right. That's right. Help and this help, bill. Help me. What, what are you asking? <laughs> well, I was getting the feeling that DCF had a lot to say about that minor, what they could and couldn't do. I see. So maybe I was unclear in my testimony about the DCF policy. I, there, this was really intended to respond to a question that came up about what about a child in DCF custody? Yeah. Um, who makes health care decisions? Who, who um, is responsible for informed consent for a child in DCF custody? Yeah. And so based on, based on DCF policy, this is, what, this is the information that I found, that caseworkers ensure that um, teens in custody have access to contraceptive services if they would like them. Um, and DCF may or may not inform that child's parents about any pregnancy-related health care that the child receives based on DCF's determination about what's in the best interest of the child. Okay, I'm so just, I didn't, I'm I, just I, getting the feeling that um, in the legislation, the way it's written, is DCF is out of the picture altogether. Any public entity is out of the picture altogether. Well, Whether it's, it's prohibited parental notification or anything. Prohibited from interfering and in, yeah. yes, interfering with the with the choice of a person to access abortion. Right. And <clears throat> Topper, that appears to be consistent with. much of DCF policy, which says, according to DCF policy, caseworkers ensure that contraceptive services are available. Um, we can have DCF in. OK, is abortion a contraceptive service? I don't know. I would ask them if that's, include, if that's included in their understanding of the word contraceptive service. And we will have DCF. Thank you for taking the time to talk about that. Thank you for helping Madam me Chair, understand your question. Our esteemed legal people. Thank God they're here. Thank God they're here. Well, I, one other thing I just would like to respond to, if I may. Um, uh, please. Um, there was some testimony that you heard today that indicated that um, the way that courts uh, interpret criminal liability for offenses um, resulting in the death of a fetus have something to do with abortion law. And I just wanted to make clear that um, courts interpret liability for offenses um, that result in the death of a fetus is, is separate and has nothing to do with the status of abortion law in Vermont right now. Um, and the common law of personhood that we had talked about is far older than any jurisprudence on abortion rights. So those issues really are, are separate. Sure that that's clear for the committee. The right to abortion did not flow from that um, common law personhood rule. There was reference to a court decision that um, someone um, testifying against the, this um, bill made today. Sorry. There was, I believe, there was, um, I was thinking about it, um, that there was, um, I, I thought there was reference to some kind of a, a different court decision. Mm -hmm. I'll have to find that. By reference to my testimony to court decisions here in Vermont pertaining to whether a uh, viable fetus is a person that Okay. Um, if you could look at um, Sharon's testimony um, more specifically, and absolutely, yes. And if you're interested, I have copies of both of those court cases here. If you'd like to, I would bring Shelby's here. <laughs> I imagine one of them is the Oliver case Oliver. and the Bell and Court case. Uh, Randy King. 
So at some point, can you? Um, yeah, so the Oliver case, I can tell you now, that's, that is um, the case that found that under our criminal statutes, Vermont follows the common law ru rule um, that a person has to be born alive in order to be con considered um, to have personhood status under Vermont's criminal statutes. We talked about that last week. Right. And, and com the common law? So that's yeah. sort of the prevailing doctrine um, uh, across the United States. It dates back to the 17th century. Um, so that common law rule is that um, it's called the born alive rule. You have to be born alive to have personhood status under the under the under the criminal statutes. Some states have um, codified differently than that common law rule, but because Vermont hasn't, then Vermont abides by the common law rule. And when you say, I, I might not say the word majority, but you said commonly. Um, so are we one of three states mm -hmm. or five states it's, or? So at the time the decision came down, which I think was in 1980, um, it was the prevailing law across the, the various states. Um, and that was now almost 30 years ago, so I will look into how many states have uh, codified something different. Thank you. So can I just clarify a question then? So if you're in a car accident and you're eight and a half months pregnant and the fetus dies as part of the accident, and you know there are two little kids in the back and they die as well you can pursue the two children in the back seat under this law mm -hmm. but not the child or the not but not the fetus is that right for for the a criminal prosecution for and, criminal prosecution. and the mother yes and the mother right okay yes okay <laughs> that's right i just wanted to make that sure Are there other um, legal questions or that we have that we would like to research or get back to us on? Um, Look at me. Okay. No, I know I'm. I'm looking at everybody. I just—it's hard not to look at. <laughs> could you, um, could you just, um, I, you and I have had this discussion. I think it might be important for the committee too. Um, Roe versus Wade. Um, as that it evolves through Casey and the other um, decisions, Roe versus Wade gets watered down. Am I correct? Um, that is one way to put it. I think that what you and I talked about was that later Supreme Court decisions moved away from uh, the conversation about the fundamental right to abortion and it applied different standards um, in its reasoning about whether or not to uphold a state regulation. So for example, the Casey Court moved to the undue burden standard. standard. So does a, does a state regulation on abortion provide um, Put, a, put an undue burden or a significant roadblock in the way of a person trying to exercise their fundamental right to an abortion. Um, so that was a different type of analysis that the court used. It wasn't quite as um, uh, high of a burden for a state to achieve a constitutionally acceptable uh, regulation on abortion. So essentially what happened was that as the jurisprudence moved along, it became, um, under Roe, it was unlawful for states to regulate abortion during the first trimester at all, basically, without reaching that, um, that strict scrutiny standard. Um, but uh, later court decisions made it clear that states could regulate abortion to some extent during the first trimester. And waiting periods. Right. Thanks. And where does the undue burden has to come into play, or just that was that thrown out in terms of the state regulation? So um, that was the Planned Parenthood versus Casey decision that used first used the undue burden standard. So it provided that um, you know the right to abortion exists, um, and a state can regulate it as long as that regulation doesn't impose an undue burden on on the right um, to access abortion. So I think one of the examples I gave from a recent court case was um, the Texas 
Texas, I think it was a 2015 Supreme Court case that um, analyzed the Texas statute that um, required abortion um, clinics providing abortion services to um, use the same clinical standards, the same, um, they had to pass all the same regulations and had, their clinics had to be uh, up to the same clinical standards as um, any other hospital, which required, a, which, was a, which, a, which was a significant burden on those clinics. Um, and what the court said is that abortion during the first trimester is no, imposes no greater risk than pregnancy or delivering a baby. Um, so the court, the state didn't have an interest um, in the health of the mother at that stage. So and that was a, an undue burden. Other questions for Brent right now? Brent, thank you. Thank you very much. Is there something we haven't asked you that we should? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think I'm at liberty to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, this, <laughs> what was the question? I said, is there like, any question, that, that anything we should have asked that we didn't? Oh, yeah. <laughs> And the, fir the first part of the memo talks more about that, um, that case, if, if you'd like more information about that. Great. Um, so, committee, what I have understood from uh, some of the testimony and the questions and what we've said, talked about right now, that um, people are interested in getting um, testimony from the hospital, particularly in terms of what kind of um, uh, whether or not they have um, conscience clauses, whatever they're called, um, the ability for someone who um, does not want to participate in the procedure as a healthcare professional, um, that um, to get a healthcare provider to talk to to ex to talk about what is healthcare, um, and maybe to whether they come in or have a memo from DCF in terms of um, their role. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, Carl. No, I was just wondering, uh, I don't know where this testimony would come from uh, as a, a professional, but uh, what are the consequences when, when parents, let's say, are not notified of uh, impending abortion, and then something goes wrong with the abortion, and, uh, and as a consequence, they're there's medical complications and problems, and what is the recourse of, of the parents in such a situation? And obviously they become aware at some point that something's happened and gone awry, but they're not in a position to take affirmative action to try to fix that situation. Well, you know, what um, I, I would I, like to I, 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 I think in that. terms of, and Brayden, you can tell me whether or not this is Half of this is something that you could research or get back to us, which is um, what recourse would a um, parent or guardian who did not know that, abort that um, an abortion was happening and, um, and if there were medical complications. And so um, what is the role of the parent? Is the parent maybe required? Can the parent do anything? Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. In other words, let's say during the course of this problem, okay, this complication, uh, the child, does the child go to the parents and tell them who initially they weren't told, mm -hmm. or do they go through some other health professional to take care of this situation? At, at what point would the health professional essentially be required to bring the family into the situation? You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I do. And I, I mean, Let's say it's it, sepsis or something like sure. that. Sure. So I think there, so there's a bunch of questions there, and I think what might be also helpful is to perhaps get from a researcher or someone some information around um, the safety or lack there of, um, of abortions and the um, percentage of time or, um, of when there are complications and what those are. Uh, because your, your, your question is embedded the beginning um, in the um, yep. things and things going wrong, and so let's find out. Um. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, 
luckily, as far as I know, not, it doesn't go wrong very often. Right. But you know, when it does, what are the implications and fallout? Um, uh, we had an email from an attorney, Curtis Carpenter, and it related to the Valancourt case that you were referencing, Brennan. I'm just wondering if we could have a little bit more information about that case and the wrongful death uh, nature of that. As, uh, um, if you would forward that um, email to Bryn, okay. mm -hmm. so that she um, what knows what she is. So? When did this come? Last Wednesday. Okay. Top of Bryn, my understanding is all of these decisions, they only apply to that particular state where the case was brought. Is that correct? The, are you talking about the U.S. Supreme Court? Decisions about Casey and so uh, the only like in that case Pennsylvania mm -hmm. that that applied to Pennsylvania period right well what the, the court's decision struck down a part of Pennsylvania statute and then it upheld another part um, so Pennsylvania statute applies in Pennsylvania but what the court says with respect to Pennsylvania statute is a signal to the other states about what they could or could not do if you do under their own statutes. Yeah. Okay, so um, bring some more some more work for you, please. And I will. Um, Did you get mine down there? You finished with your list. <laughs> um, medical provider. What is health care? And then well, Bryn. No, define health care services. Is abortion a health care service? And is abortion a contraceptive service? In terms of this bill, when we define it. We, we haven't defined it, but I think we need to because the word is used. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bryn. And um, committee, um, after, mm. after lunch and after the House floor, we are coming back 15 minutes after the uh, House floor. Um, Dr. Levine is going to come and um, we are, for the, those of you who are interested, we are changing subjects um, and we are continuing our committee um, education around what are, what are the other issues and that we are paying attention to or need to know about. And um, um, our commissioner of the Department of Health and others will provide, be providing us with an overview of what is what is the Department of Health and what are the areas that they cover and things like that? Thank you all very so much. Did you say there would be a public hearing? On yes. The yes, there is. Um, I believe a um, notice has gone out. Um, and so for all, if it has been. Oh, well, Orca is here. I guess the rest of the press decided it wasn't interesting anymore. No. <laughs> um, we are having a public hearing next Wednesday in the well of the house from um, 4.30 to 6.30. Um, people will be, get, be able to sign up beginning at 4 o'clock. Um, in order to, and this is, I want to say on some level, primarily for mem members of the public who have wanted to testify and have, um, whether it's weather, whether it's work, um, other things like that have not um, been able to testify. And so in order to give um, uh, the opportunity to as many people as possible, we are limiting testimony to two minutes so that there could be upwards of um, 100 people um, to testify. Um, <clears throat> in other, um, we will be following the same procedure that we have used in that is tra this tradition in the State House, which is that um, people will be um, presenting, testifying pro or con um, the bill. And um, I will take one pro and one con, one pro and one con, one pro and one con in terms of that to give um, equal opportunity to perspectives on the bill. Um, and. Uh, And the, and the public hearing will be over at 6.30. I was going to say that 
I mean, I'm sure it's going to come out, but like you said, we're there to listen, not to be. Right. We are there to listen. Um, and so we will not be, I mean, and in two minutes you don't want to ask us questions. I would, you will see who, and we will be doing this, um, it, this is a public hearing that we will be having jointly with House Judiciary, because if folks um, don't, we're not aware, um, whatever action this committee takes on it, um, unless we decide not to pass the bill at all, but assuming that we pass some version some amendment, some version of H-57. Um, it will go on the House floor, and, and then it will be going to, and there will be no vote. Go on the calendar. It will go on the calendar. It will go, go, go on the calendar for notice. There will be no vote, and it will. its next stop will be to House Judiciary. So um, if you can let people know who have big interest in this, um, to realize that they will that there is another opportunity um, in another committee as well.